I want to talk to you today about something called the harmony of the spheres. Now this is an idea that links mathematics and music on a cosmic scale and it goes back two and a half thousand years to the time of the ancient Greeks. The belief was that the planets and the earth and the moon as they go around make sounds, harmonious sounds, which we can't actually hear but which are sort of out there. Now, well, we know today, of course, that this isn't true because for one thing, sound can't travel through a vacuum. So although that old idea has been discredited, strangely enough, it did have an important effect on our understanding of how the planets actually move and also had an influence on music and in particular, the development of our modern system of tuning. Now, you might think this is incredible, but that's what this video is about. It's about the harmony of the spheres and how this idea has had a major influence on our current thinking in science and on our modern system of music. The Greeks discovered that there's a strong link between music and mathematics. Pythagoras and his followers in the 6th century BC built an entire cult around their belief that all is number, and that the whole numbers were especially significant. In music, the Pythagoreans discovered that the most harmonious sounding intervals corresponded with whole number ratios. A vibrating string held down at its halfway point sounds an octave higher than when open held down and played so that the lengths of the vibrating to the non-vibrating sections are in the ratio 3 to 2 gives a perfect fifth, a ratio 4 to 3 gives a perfect fourth, and 5 to 4 a major third. Since frequency depends on 1 over the string length, these ratios also give a relationship between the frequencies of the notes. The simplest of the ratios, apart from the octave, the perfect fifth, is the basis for what's become known as Pythagorean tuning. I've recorded a video on this that you might like to check out. Pythagorean tuning was used by musicians in the West until about the end of the 15th century, when its limitations for playing a wider variety of pieces became apparent. So enamored were the Pythagoreans with their discovery that simple ratios of vibrating strings equated to harmonious musical intervals and their belief that the universe was based on whole numbers, that they saw a perfect marriage of music and mathematics in the heavens. At the centre of physical space, according to their cosmology, was a great fire. Around this, carried on transparent celestial spheres and moving in circular paths, were ten objects, in order from the centre, a counter-Earth, Earth itself, the Moon, the Sun, the five known planets or wandering stars, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, and finally the fixed stars. The separations between these spheres, they believed, corresponded to the harmonic lengths of strings, so that the movement of the spheres gave rise to a sound, inaudible to human ears, known as the harmony of the spheres. Both the Greek words harmonia meaning agreement and arithmos meaning number come from the same Indo-European root, Ari. Harmonia was also the Greek goddess of peace and harmony, fittingly since her parents were Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and Ares, the god of war. The Pythagorean idea that musical harmonies were inherent in the spacing of heavenly bodies persisted throughout the Middle Ages. The philosophy of musica universalis, universal music, found its way into the Quadrivium, a quartet of academic subjects including arithmetic, geometry, music and astronomy, that was taught after the Trivium, grammar, logic and rhetoric in medieval European universities, and was based on Plato's curriculum for higher education. At the heart of the Quadrivium was the study of number in various forms, pure number, arithmetic, number in abstract space, geometry, number in time, music, and number in space and time, astronomy. Following the lead of Pythagoras, Plato saw an intimate connection between music and astronomy, music expressing the beauty of simple numerical proportions to the ears and astronomy to the eyes. Through different senses, they expressed the same underlying unity based on mathematics. 
More than 2,000 years later, the German astronomer Johann Kepler took the notion of a musical cosmos a step further. Kepler believed in astrology and was devoutly religious, as were many other intellectuals of his time, but he was also a key figure in the scientific revolution of the Renaissance. He is best remembered for his three laws of planetary motion, built on the foundation of accurate observations of the planets by the Danish nobleman Tycho Brahe. Early in his career, Kepler was fascinated by the notion that there might be a geometric basis to the spacing of the planets. To the sun-centered model of the solar system proposed earlier by the Polish astronomer Nicolaus Copernicus, Kepler, in his 1597 Mysterium Cosmographicum, the Cosmographic Mystery, added the idea that the five platonic solids, the only regular convex polyhedra in 3D, held the key to the spacing of worlds. By inscribing and circumscribing with spheres these solids in a certain order, octahedron, icosahedron, dodecahedron, tetrahedron and cube, Kepler believed he could generate the orbs within which the six known planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, moved. Going beyond mere speculation, Kepler carried out acoustic experiments at a time, the dawn of the 17th century, when testing ideas in practice was still a novel concept in academic circles. Using a monochord, he checked the sound made by the string when stopped at different lengths, and established by ear what divisions were most pleasing. As well as the fifth, which was of all consuming importance to the Pythagoreans, he noted that the third, the fourth, the sixth, and various other intervals were also consonant. He wondered if these harmonious ratios might be reflected in the heavens, so that the old notion of the harmony of the spheres might be brought up to date, and more in line with the latest observations. Perhaps the ratio of the greatest and least distances between planets and the sun matched some of the consonant intervals he'd found. But no, they didn't. He considered then the speed of the planets at the points of maximum and minimum distance, where he knew from observations that they moved the slowest and the fastest, respectively, in relation to the sun. Movement, he noted, would be a better analogue than distance to the vibration of a string, and indeed, using this planetary property, he found what seemed to be a connection. In the case of Mars, the ratio of its extreme orbital speeds measured in terms of angular motion across the sky was about 2 to 3, equivalent to a perfect fifth. The extreme motions of Jupiter differed by a ratio of about 5 to 6, a minor third in music, and those of Saturn by very close to 4 to 5, a major third. The corresponding ratios for Earth and Venus were 15 to 16, roughly the difference between me and far, and 24 to 25, respectively. Encouraged by these correspondences, which of course are in fact bogus, Kepler went in search of more subtle cosmic harmonies. He looked at the ratios of the speeds of neighbouring worlds and convinced himself that harmonious ratios underpinned not only the movement of planets individually, but also how they move relative to one another. All of these thoughts on the subject he wrapped into a grand unified theory of how consonant intervals in music were linked to movements in the heavens, and published it in his magnum opus, Harmonices Mundi, The Harmony of the World, in 1619. Shortly after, he made a discovery that today is known as the third law of planetary motion. He found a precise connection between the time it takes a planet to go once around the sun and its distance from the sun, namely, the square of a planet's period is proportional to the cube of its semi-major axis. This is the relationship still taught in physics classes today, but it was uncovered originally during the course of Kepler's mystical studies into the harmonic structure of the cosmos. Kepler helped propel astronomy into the modern era with his crucial insight that the orbits of planets aren't circular, as the ancients had believed, but elliptical. This paved the way for Newton's universal theory of gravitation, but less obviously, it set the stage for innovative and more flexible systems of tuning in music. From his experiments in auditory space, Kepler wondered if there was a smallest interval, a lowest common factor from which all other harmonies could be built. He found that there wasn't. Just as planetary orbits weren't based on perfect circles, 
there was no neat and simple way to achieve musical consonants using one fundamental interval. This became most obvious when any attempt was made to change the key of a piece of music. Pythagorean tuning is one example of what's called just tuning, in which the frequency of notes is related by ratios of reasonably small whole numbers. If we take the scale of C major, for example, divide it up into eight pitches, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and give the tonic or root note C the ratio 1 to 1, and the fifth G the ratio 3 to 2, in Pythagorean tuning the notes above C have the following frequency ratios relative to C. D 9 to 8, E 5 to 4, F 81 to 64, G 3 to 2, A 27 to 16, B 16 to 19, and C, the octave up, is 2 to 1. This arrangement works fine providing we stay in the same key or use flexible instruments such as the human voice which can make fine adjustments to intonation on the fly. But any form of just tuning runs into problems with instruments like the piano, which once tuned can only produce certain frequencies. Composers and musicians earlier than Kepler had started to break out of the rigid confines of Pythagorean tuning, but it was around Kepler's time that the first important moves in Europe at least were made away from the notion of just tuning altogether. A pioneer of the new trend was Galileo's father, Vincenzo Galilei, who advocated a 12-tone scale based on what became known as equal temperament. In this system, every neighbouring pair of notes is separated by the same interval or ratio of frequencies. With 12 semitones or half steps, the width of each interval is the 12th root of 2, or about 1.059. In other words, 12 copies of 1.059 multiplied together is 2. Arranged like this, none of the frequencies of 12-tone equal temperament exactly match those of the corresponding notes in just intonation, except at the tonic and octave, although fourths and fifths are so close as to be almost indistinguishable. Equal temperament is a compromise. It isn't as pure sounding as just intonation, but it has the huge advantage of enabling music to be played that's acceptably harmonious in any key without the need for retuning. It made keyboard instruments such as the piano practical and musically flexible and opened up broad new horizons in composition and orchestration. <laughs>